It's a privilege and a joy that we can continue our study in the book of the prophet Daniel. We are studying today the sixth chapter, and that is from the lion's den to the angel's den. We remember that the book of Daniel was written with the purpose to prepare teachers. They have to be teachers for the last time. That's our time. And their ultimate goal is to lead as many as possible on the path of righteousness. This is the job of the children of God. They are the teachers. They must have His name written on their foreheads. I mean, they must be recognized as His children. And they will prove to their message the revelation of the righteousness and love of God. And all the actions of God in the Bible are their study and their resources. And we don't forget that at the bottom of everything is the law of selflessness. Nothing can exist from itself and nothing was made for itself. This, the people of God, that will be the teachers of this last day, will know for sure in their lives. Because this is the law and the prophets all together. Now let us look as an overview to the sixth chapter of Daniel. And we put together the actions of God, because God is the one that acts in every chapter as a primary actor. And we have here King Darius. God allows the conspiracy against Daniel. Daniel is about almost 80 years old or about 80 years old. And he should have a peaceful life evening, we would say. But no, God is a good God. He knows how much a servant of him can endure. So he allows in old age to get into a conspiracy, to have enemies. Darius, the king, enacts a law with the consequence of death by lions. I mean, to throw them in the lions then. If anyone else is worshipped beside him within 30 days. How can a king give such a command? Now we must see that the, the leaders of the country, he, he put princes and he put presidents over his country. And this princess, 120, and the presidents, one of them was Daniel, three of them, uh, they were jealous on Daniel and they thought how to get rid of Daniel because the king liked him and wanted to put him as a president over all the country. Now, how can you tempt the king to give a law that you should be worshipped? Now, we know that the subconscious, our heart says we are gods, and that's why you can always tempt a person by the way of arising his pride, trying to show, oh, you are you're so great. And so they came to him and says, King, we want to make you greater than you are. <gasps> the king, how will you do that? Well, we thought that if for 30 days you would be like a god, that no one should ask for anyone from anyone else something just from you. Your honor in the whole country will grow and your love and goodness and all this will come out and people will just worship you, we'll be happy. And so King says, well, that's a good idea. Maybe he has slept one or two nights over it, but his pride was nurtured and he said, okay, let's do it. He didn't think much because it was about him. Only when they came to him and said about Daniel who did not obey his command, he discovers the conspiracy. He discovers that this presidents and princes just came to him, not because of him, but because they wanted to kill Daniel. Oh, imagine his rage. Imagine when you discover that someone lied to you while wanting you to rise you up. He just came behind your back. And he, he just 
showed you things like he is so interested in your welfare, but they were just interested to kill Daniel because they were interested in their own welfare, in their own pride. Through that law, they did not want to make the king big but themselves. Imagine the king now realizes the real thing. Would you think he gets angry? I am convinced he got very angry. And he would have killed them right away, but he had no reason for it. First, he wanted to help Daniel. He tries to save Daniel, but he cannot save him because of the law of media Persia that is not unchangeable. But he trusts in Daniel's God that he can protect him from the lion's mouth. He can protect them. And so he protects the lion's den. He seals it with his own seal and with the seal of his president. And he says, okay, no one is allowed to touch this. And he goes into his palace and he is without rest. He cannot eat, cannot sleep, cannot drink. And he awaits the morning to come. And he believes somehow that God might have saved him. And yes, God intervenes so that the lions do not harm Daniel. You see, we know from the law that every person uses God's power. Even the lions uses God's power to eat or whatever they do. But here now God, at every time, because it's his active power, he can retract his power so that no one can do anything. Now he can do that directly through his intervention or through the angel's intervention, doesn't matter. It's the same thing. Even the angel uses God's power to put back or to take away the lion's power. So they can do nothing with it. But interesting is that when the king now throws the conspirators and their families into the lion's den, the lion tore them in pieces even before they get to the bottom of that den. And you might ask, why? Why does not God have an angel there for the evildoers? Well, let's look first from the perspective of Darius. Why did he do that? Now, I'm sure if he would have found Daniel's death that morning, they would have followed the same. He might have found a reason. And he might have took them to himself and said, you have lied unto me. You are traitors of the kingdom. You are persons that you are dis you disqualify yourself from a leading position by this, what you do. And for this, you will end up in death. And not only you, but your whole families. And God agrees with the judgment of Darius. God does not agree with the judgment of Darius when he puts Daniel in the lion's den. God does not agree with the judgment of Nebuchadnezzar when he puts his three servants in the fiery furnace. Doesn't get agree, and so when God doesn't agree, nothing happens. But here he agrees because it is about righteousness. The king must give an example through all his servants that if you come and you try by deception to destroy a person or to be evil, you will end up in death. Now, unfortunately, in the Bible lesson book, it is written that this was a custom just in the medo persian Empire, among the Persians. Well, I wonder, did they read in the Bible that God does the same. Do you remember the situation when Israel entered Canaan and they took Jericho and Achan stole some of those things that were banned to destruction? 
and he hid them under his tent. And then they go out. The whole army goes out to fight against the city of A. And, and Joshua thinks this is a small thing to do. We will, we will get the victory by nothing. And they are defeated. And thousands of soldiers die. And Joshua goes to God and says, Lord, what is, what's wrong? And God says, there is sin in Israel. There is unrighteousness there. And so Joshua must rise and he must do his things. And since Achan doesn't come forth, he is found out just by uh, the taking of lots. Who is killed? Who is condemned to death by stoning Achan or his whole family? Read it. It's his whole family. Who is getting the disease of Naaman, the Syrian? Does it only Gehazi get because he was covetous like Achan? And he lied to it. He hides it. Same situation. And God intervenes the same. And he puts the disease not only on, name, on, on Gehazi, but on his whole family for eternity. That's how the Bible says that is for the whole life. I think it was the Ammonites when the people of Israel entered Canaan came and they disguised themselves like they come from very far country having old bread and 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 they came and said we want to make a, a pact of peace because we are from far away so we don't disturb but let's make a pact of peace but they were just the inhabitants of the country they came to overcome and Joshua made a pact with them of, of none fighting against each other. And so they could not destroy these people who were doomed to destruction. The Ammonites or Moabites, I don't know exactly. But you might find it out in the Bible. And it doesn't matter yet, it just matters the principle that we need to understand. But King Saul, the first king, he fights against his people. And he breaks the covenant. Does he break the covenant with the people that was made with? Or does he break the covenant that was done before God? Because every covenant is done before God. And God brings a punishment upon the whole country in the, in the times after Saul is dead. And it's King David. And David asks God, what's wrong why do we have this dying in the land? And God says, because there is iniquity in the land. And so this thing, this covenant breaking was not forgotten by God. And there were taken seven sons of Saul that were given to these people to kill them. And when they were killed... The Bible says the wrath of God ceased. Is God a righteous God? Yes, he is. And he will never, he will never clear the guilty. Because he loves the sinner. He wants to make us free from sin. But if someone stays with that, he must know that that has a consequence for him and in the earthly things also for the people who are under his service. You see, when King Saul did that, going against those people, he did it as a representative of the whole people. And the whole people was affected. You see, when you have a representation, when you're a leader, when you're a president of something, when you're a leader in the church, the effect or in the family will be upon all. Now, everyone is judged individually before God for salvation or not. But for the consequences on earth, you are included. 
We might wonder maybe on the day of, of judgment that maybe Achan's wife will be saved, even though she had to be killed with him together in that situation. If she didn't have known it. I mean, if she would know, who knows? But we don't all know. So God judges individually, but the effects, the physical effects, I want to make very clear the physical effects of a leader of a family, if you're drunkard or whatever he does, will be in his family. If he is a leader of a church, of a, he's not responsible for what others do. And this is where people get very confused because they think that if they're leaders, they're responsible for what others do. Never you're responsible for what others do. But since you're a leader, you're responsible for what you do, and it will affect those who you were put in front of to lead them, to administer them. That is a physical effect. That's why one was the one that did the wrong, and the whole people were affected by it, even though they did not do the same thing like he did. Now, in the judgment day, God will judge everyone individually. No one will stand for the other one. But the effects, the physical effects of what the person does, especially a leader, will affect all those he is there. And so it will have consequences for everyone, not for eternity, but for the time present. I hope we understand that. That's a short parenthesis thesis about this thing because it brings a lot of confusion if we don't know the righteousness of God and I think in this case we can see that God is a fearful God not in the way that we should fear him as a person but we should fear to do something wrong we should fear to be to 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 accuse to to be diplomats who bring half-truths somewhere in. We should fear that because God will not stand those things. He gives Daniel even greater influence in the middle Persia, and Darius makes a commandment to honor the God of Daniel throughout the land. So let us conclude this idea of worship. We know the law says that everyone is dependent and everyone needs to connect to someone. And Daniel, being a child of God, trusts God and he does and acts justice in front of the king and in front of God. He's just. But here, the king, who thinks he's a god, and all the other people who come to him, to seduce him, looking like it is for him, but they actually wanted their own welfare. They bring the king and to the lie says, okay, you must trust your president. They want the good for you. And so he trusts them and what he does is injustice. Everyone who trusts humans does injustice. Sin is trusting someone else and not God. There's only one vulnerable thing in our life and that is who we are. And the consequence of it is, do I trust God or not? Do I take from him or not? Now, these people knew that worshipping is taking. They knew it is trust. It's not effect. Yes, the outside thing that Daniel did is an effect of whom he trusts. But let us read Daniel 6, verse 10. It says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Now, are you going to change when people say you are not allowed to do that anymore, at least for 30 days? Could not Daniel say in his heart, okay, trust is uh, inside, so I can pray inside. And I can do like I don't. For, for 30 days, nothing will happen. But if I, if I now pray and they see me and I'm going to die, 
then what will do out of the work of God? So Daniel could have said, oh, I want to save God's work, and I, I'm going to, to pray to God, but not evidently. No, Daniel might not even have thought like that, because he was true. You see, for 80 years he served his God. And now when a final test appears in his life, yes, it's a threat to death. He knew that he will end up in the lion's den. He knew it because the law of media pages, the sign the king, will not excuse him. He knew the plots against him. He knew everything. And yet he did not change his outside behavior, neither his inside trust in God. If that's how I will honor God in death, I'll do it. So he did not change. But he went and did what he always did. So are you vulnerable to change when certain things come? Are you vulnerable to, to get let go of that what you always did and was right until then and now you will do it different? I hope not. If I did something all the time well, I will continue to do that, no matter what comes against it. No matter. That's how we have to act. And I have went, I went through certain situations, not life-threatening, of course, but in which you had to get some gain for your ministry or for something you do, if you would just change certain things. And said, I'm sorry. I started this with God. And I did it like this with God. And he did not reprove it. He did not say it must be changed. But he confirmed and blessed it. I will not depart from that. No matter if I'm accepted or not accepted. Because my trust must be proven if it is in God, if it is in God, or if it is in humans. There is only these two things. There is no more sin in whom you trust will prove your action. Now Daniel praised, he says here, he prayed and gave thanks before his God. Now imagine, might he have given thanks because he was put into the thing? Might have said, Lord... I thank you for this circumstance because once again your name will be glorified. Once again you will sh steal the show to the devil and your name will be glorified in front of the whole people. Why do we give thanks? Now let us be very clear. Worship is taking, is trusting. And what we take, we must do something with it. And that brings a fruit. And that fruit, we pass on to God. It's the fruit that we thank God for, that we could bring it for the result of the work. It's not for our work. We thank God because we have the privilege to be channeled. We can co-work with Him for the great results. This is the circuit of beneficence that most people don't understand. And if you don't understand it, if you don't understand this law, the greatest temptation that awaits the people, and it's, always, it's already there, is to make out of the worship of God a purpose. That means worship of God will be the purpose, will be the center of everything. You see, Daniel was the center of, of his worship was three times a day. Not everything. He did not worship God in order to worship God, but he took in order to be able to serve God. But when you do it the wrong way, when you worship God for the purpose to worship God, you work on your relationship with God because you want to have a good relationship with God, you're in deception. Because if you're a child of God, your relationship with God is a natural relationship. You don't need to work on it. 
If you are a child of God, you don't need to, re- to work on your relationship with your wife or with anyone. Because relationship is a means by which you accomplish a, path, a, a purpose. But in our minds, we are confused. And the devil will say, come and worship God. And they were worshipping God by they worshipping him. Because they worship him by giving him something. Putting worship as a purpose. It will be so cunningly devised. That only those who know the law. Only those who know that worship is taking. Is trusting. In order to be able to give. And we praise God for the ability to take and co-work with him and we give all the honor for the result to him not to us so we don't give anything from us to God everything we take out of us comes from him so why should we be boasting of everything of anything let's make that clear I repeat it and repeat again and again the greatest temptation will be to make out of God an idol, to think the worshipping God is purpose. Now, Daniel had friends and enemies. The king was obviously his friend, and his colleagues were his enemies. And he says in verse 11, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Yes, he was asking God for something in order to give. And we know them. Darius is a friend. He wants to make him superior. He wants to make him prince of everyone because he has a superior spirit in him. But his colleagues are jealous and want to get rid of him. They look for errors because if you want to get rid of someone, you need to find errors. If he does good, you cannot get rid of him. But they find none. So it's nice that friends and enemies find nothing. They have the same, the same result. The friends know you well. And you see, the enemies sometimes know you also well. Not always, but they need to find something. If they don't find something, they must look for something. Now, what functions quite well is when you can put rumors about someone into the field. When you can bring false accusations. Now, they could not record, uh, uh, go to this method because the king knew Daniel. You see, you cannot speak evil about a person if, I mean, to a person about someone else if that person you speak to knows the person very well. And Daniel was very well known to the king, so they could not come with rumors or false accusation. But this works with us very well. I once had a, a, a patient who wanted and sign up with me in a seminar to talk to me. But before he came for counseling, he phoned another physician and asked him if uh, I was a good physician and what I share is correct or not. And since that physician was a very influential person and said to him about me, oh no, what he says is not right. And also he asked a pastor who knows me, and he said also, the pastor said, no, no, don't, don't, uh, uh, he's not right. So he canceled his appointment with me. But you know why he did it? He did it exactly because he trusted humans. He never came to prove the point. You see, this is how the devil works. He can work through very influential people to speak about the children of God, bad things or accusations or whatever they say. And if you don't go and prove it, you become partakers of the same lie. Because you put your trust in a human. You don't go and verify it. You don't ask the person that was spoken about to ask to verify. And since I'm in the open, so to say, uh, work, when you work in, as a physician and also as a speaker, you get rumors about you. And I have many rumors that circulating out there. And the interesting thing is that none of those persons that spread the rumors 
know me or have asked me if things are so or not. Isn't that fantastic? Isn't that amazing? So, they could not recur to that, what is very, very basic in our church and in our world. You just need to put a rumor about someone. And if you're influential enough, all will believe you. But friends, don't forget that those who brought the rumor, those who brought the accusation against Daniel, ended up in the lion's den. It's a fearful thing to believe a lie. It's a fearful thing to believe a person that says a lie without you proving it for yourself, if it's so or not. So they have no accusation. They find only one thing. Daniel's faithfulness to God is his only vulnerable point. Isn't that fantastic? If people find in your life only one vulnerable point, and that is your loyalty to your God. If that is the case, then you can praise God three times a day because you reach the goal. In front of people, you are without fault. The king knows that Daniel is without fault. He has done nothing wrong and he punishes the traitors with the punishment they tried to kill Daniel with. So Daniel's lifetime was a childhood. He grew up in a God-fearing family, but under a godless society. People of Israel were fallen. Very early in his youth, he was a Babylonian prisoner and he was tested right away. Now, for sure, he was tested here as well, but we find the first test where it is about his life. Now, there was not a, a, a test that says, if you don't eat, you die, but it could have happened. But he nevertheless did not want to eat and drink from the king's unclean food. So as an adult, he is a Babylonian royal officer. He's spotless in all his business. And as an old age person, he is a medio Persian royal officer, a president that wants to be put on the whole country. And he's tested in these last years or day of his life. So the testings are increasing in character with the time. You see, at the end of your life, the test is the highest because it proves either that you're faultless or you still have something to overcome. So God never lets a person not be tested. And Daniel's character is the character of those who will spread the last message, who will be the teachers, because they must be like the character of Daniel, like the character of their Lord, blameless. Why? Because how shall God represent himself with a faulty people? How could God honor Daniel? Or how could Daniel honor God? having in his life sins, faults, anger, or whatever he had. He could not have that. God could put him in the center and he could make ashamed all the capitals, the captives and princes of the land through one life, exactly like he did with the three friends of him in the fiery furnace. It could be said about Daniel's life, it was a flawless, a faultless life, a life left to the glory of God. And God says itself, you're mostly beloved. And he says to Daniel, go and sleep until you will resurrect for your inheritance. We are called to be like Daniel. My and your life. Let's look to it. Look to your childhood. Were you tested? Look to your youth. Maybe your youth yet. Were you tested? Your adult, were you tested? Yes, God with 39 years converted me. And since then, I am in his test. And I know as I get older and older, the tests will increase 
and the last test will be the greatest one. If God has chosen me and you to be among the 144,000 and go through the time of trouble, then that time will be the greatest test. But we will testify, we will show in that test that our lives are anchored in God, that we are trusting him and no death decree, no advantage or disadvantage of the world will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So let's put your, this question. A flawless life that is a righteous life, live to the glory of God. Would you like that that should be said about you? Would you like that that should be written on the record of your life at the end? I want that. And I hope you too. But it will require a clear faith, a clear test. And every test, when we don't pass them today, we make a victory out of it, removing the error. Until the day comes, then the test just proves that we're ready and faultless. May God give us this end to be his servants. And to represent him like Daniel represented him in front of a fallen world. A few brave men and women will justify God in his love and in his righteousness. And what could be a higher call than that? I want to be among them. And I hope you too. Amen.